I, we kind of glossed out. If you guys just want to give a brief introduction to yourself, I guess Mr. Malcolmson kind of already did with plugging his podcast there, but uh, Ashley, if you want to talk a little bit about yourself before we get started. Yeah, so I just graduated, graduated high school. I'm going to be an incoming freshman at Murray State University. I am going to be a political science major, so fun. So, All well, right. That's thank excellent. you. Uh, we're glad to have you guys. All right, so this this episode, we're talking about the famous movie from the 1950s called 12 Angry Men, which is ranked in IDBM's uh, top 10 movies all, of all time. So, um, so this movie follows the jury in a trial for a boy who allegedly murdered his father. Um, but unlike... But unlike most uh, courtroom dramas, this movie focuses on the jury rather than the defense attorney. So, um, and you see throughout the movie that these 12 jurors have their own quarrels. Uh, but eventually they decide that the, that the boy is not guilty. So, uh, let's get started. So our first segment will feature quotes, which we will analyze. So, uh, Colton, would you care to read this first quote? Uh, the first quote is from juror, juror number eight, right? I'm reading that, right? Right, and that's Henry Fonda's character, the one who knew, who decides from the very beginning that the boy is not guilty. And, uh, yeah, he's sort of the main character of the movie, I would say, and he says, we're talking about someone's life here. We can't decide that in five minutes, which is sort of you know, we were discussing beforehand that this movie isn't super quotable, but I, I'm going to redact that now because I think that's a very quotable line. Um, especially, but it's kind of the whole premise of the movie, I would say. I would say so. Uh, what do you think, Ashlyn? I think that's very true. There are a lot of facts in a case, and even in 1957, when and they didn't have DNA or anything that's concrete evidence, there was still a lot of circumstances to go over. And I think that Juror understood that at the very beginning. And Mr. Malcolm, what about you? Yeah, I completely agree with Colton and Ashlyn both. The, the, when, just look at the era when this movie comes out. And I know I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but I, I'm a high school teacher too. I had all three of you as students somewhere along the line. I also run a club called Law Club. So it's very fitting to have me on this episode. And, that, and I love how important uh, Ashlyn's mentioning how the jury can be. And I think that Colton hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, this movie is really about the value of a hum human being. Like how much should we value the, a human being's life? And I think there's multiple factors that need to be considered. But I also think that we can't overlook the historical context of the scene that's taking place here. So we're right smack in the middle of the civil rights era in America too. Even though there, there aren't necessarily like racial minorities in the movie, we see different ethnic groups, minorities, and a, and a little bit of bigotry towards Italian immigrants and whatnot. But this is right there in the middle of an era where there is a lot of uh, obnoxious opinions about people's, I guess, biases towards other people. I, I just really think this movie's incredible. It's incredible for the 1950s. And I think the entire premise, it would even, it's even relatable today. I mean, look at the way our society has been going on here recently. These issues are, are so paramount now, not just back in the 1950s. I definitely, I agree um, with what you said. And it's kind of stupid to say on a podcast where we talk about movies, I hadn't considered the historical context of the civil rights movement. And even though there aren't any, I don't believe there are any colored actors in this movie, I think it's very obvious that they're, they're still dealing with um, prejudices based on where people are born or where they, where, they're, where they grow up and what kind of environment they live in. Especially when it comes to uh, juror, number 10, juror number 10, who you later find out has a, a pretty severe uh, racial bias against the boy on trial. So, um, so that, that's obviously a reason why, uh, that's obviously, uh, s uh, something you can take away from the time. Uh, but at the same time, you also have biases based on, uh, past experiences, uh, like juror number three, for example, who, who's the longest to hold out 
uh, and and uh, and claim that the boy on trial is guilty uh, because you find out that the boy reminds him of his 22 year old son who who he hadn't seen in two years up to that point. Uh, so what do you what do you all make of uh, personal prejudice? I think that it is something that is still being played in the courtroom and the deliberation rooms, but in this one specifically, um, they basically show how a person who doesn't believe that they're biased or prejudiced themselves kind of have some hidden prejudice that they don't like to admit, but when it comes down to the wire, it comes out. Yeah, again, I agree with Ashlyn. I don't know how much I'm going to really agree with her on this show, but we'll we'll see as we go through the episode. But it, it is, it's very obvious that all of them have their own kind of skeletons in the closet or their own things that they're, they're not, they, you, it's like you know it's there, but they don't really want to address it. And, and it takes a lot of battling through the movie. And I think that's what makes this movie so much of a social masterpiece to me is just to watch and to try to I don't know if you guys know much about like FBI profiling but just to try like if we had to sit down and profile all 12 jury members to try to really describe you know their biases and uh different things that they may have been subjected to whenever they were younger that that's really apparent in the movie and I think that's really interesting I think so too all right are you two ready to move on to the next quote sure oh yeah I have uh, I have just one final comment on this um, relating to the the sort of FBI profiling thing. I feel like um, it's interesting to sort of see. I think that there were bonds formed in that in that jury room, which is strange to say, but I think it's an interesting point that they go in the room strangers, and after deliberating for the entire movie, they come out whether friends or not is debatable, but knowing each other better in, in it, you know, in any case. I think so. And I think that's, uh, I think that's another great thing to take away from this movie. Yeah. That, it's and, and, you see it, and you see in the, in uh, about halfway through the movie, uh, juror number 11, who I think is uh, another uh, foreigner. He's think, a European Im- immigrant. Uh, Poland, European. I think, right? Is it was he mm-hmm. Polish? Yeah. And uh you see you hear him make a have a you hear him with his own monologue about uh about how we how we should be blessed to live in democracy where we can uh come into a room together and uh decide whether a a boy that they don't even know needs needs to die for something he did mm-hmm. so so that's uh i know i know it kind of sounds uh sort of paradoxical that way but uh mm-hmm. i think i think that's really that's really a good message to take away from this movie yeah and Colton, I think that this movie, when you guys brought up the, the immigrant one, I went to, I think it was jury number 10 or 11. Um, this, this whole jury, it's almost like a great microcosm of the 20th century in the United States. So it wasn't just the civil rights era, but even look at, at the, the bigotry between like Eastern European immigrants in the 20s and in the 30s and whatnot. It, there's a little bit of issues that are going on in the movie. Although like Colton says, this movie does lack racial diversity in it but yet it it addresses so many complex ideas. And that bond you were talking about, Colton, we do see that humanism a little bit at the very end. Whenever, I know that this podcast will have spoilers in it. I I think that, I guess we should warn people that are listening that haven't seen the movie, is that, you know, at the end, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Cody or Colton or Tracy, um, let's just say Ashlyn, my bad. I said your last name. Ashlyn is, I think we don't even get their names until the very end. I think it's, jury number eight of course our protagonist and it was nine it was the eldest of all the jury members doesn't he introduce himself to jury number eight at the very end of the movie on the steps and and that's where i did see a bond and colton has got a point there because i think jury number eight is a good representation of all of us he is like the archetypal every man and even though he's not saying the boy is innocent he's just saying that 
there may not be enough evidence to convict this boy for his life. And I think that's a fair kind of way to do it. And I think we can all relate to him so well in the movie. You know, speaking of archetypes, uh, you notice that juror number eight uh, wears a white jacket in the movie. This was something right after watching the movie, I we talked about um, that uh, it seems like everyone else in the room is wearing darker colors, but juror number eight is wearing a lighter suit. And you can't really tell what color it is because it's a black and white movie, but it's it seems like a, it, they contrasted it with like very intentionally, I guess. All right, I think we're ready to move on. So our next quote comes from, uh, actually, Ashlyn, you suggested this quote. Why don't you introduce it? Okay, well, this one was from the Richard Scrooge trial and uh, one of their attorneys, Jim Parkman, in his opening statement in a case that seems like all odds were against him, he said, no matter how thin you pour it, there are always two sides to a pancake in reference to a trial. And I think that is so important because when they start this trial, it seems at the very beginning that all odds were against this kid. But once they started digging into it, they flipped to that pancake and they saw that other side and they started questioning, is this side the right side of the pancake? I, re I really like that quote, Ashlyn. Thank you for suggesting that to us, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, Colton and I are uh, currently watching the old Perry Mason show. Uh, and you know, you always—it's always pretty clear what the what the prosecution's case is going to be. Uh, but what's not so clear until the end is uh, what the defense's case is. So, uh, and I, and I think that that doesn't just apply to uh, the courtroom. That also applies to real life. That that applies anywhere. Anywhere you go, what do you what do you think, Colton? There's, it reminds me of an old saying that our dad and I don't know, like everybody we know, um, has where it's like there's always, you know, three sides to any argument. There's his side, her side, and the truth, which is, I feel like, maybe that's a little cynical, but I I think it 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 just reminds me of that. I didn't really have anything great to add, just. <laughs> just sort of that that um that it reminds me of that quote that's a good reference I, I have to say cody something about ashlyn's quote which is so good I, I really like it it reminds me a little bit of you your first year of college and where you would communicate with me as a teacher just about some of the things you were devils advocating on in the class and i guess what i want to build off of ashlyn's quote is that I think this is a good place to bring up confirmation bias. I think sometimes things can appear so crystal clear. And then so where Ashlyn brings up a great point with that quote is that there are two sides to everything. And, and in all these stories we've got going on, especially the differences between the reports on COVID-19 and whatnot, I think, and you have people that are conspiracy theorists that thinks it's, it's all been planted and it's all been a big plan. You have ones that are over here that thinks it's not. I think there's, there's some kind of a truth always in the middle but with that quote that Ashton brought up with, I don't think that we ever know the complete truth of something unless both sides of that pancake or coin are investigated. Uh, so I think as Cody, you would recommend, or you would say last year, if I would have talked to you this time last year at school, if it seems like everybody in the room, when you're talking about a controversial topic is all on the same side, like that, like super fast, that should be a little scary. That means it's a little too obvious. Like there's something that we had to be missing here and I always respected about you, Cody, or Colton or Ashland in Law Club, is that you you all three are the type that would, wouldn't be so fast to go, yeah, you know, this just seems good. I'm kind of tired at school. I just want really to want to go and let's get out of here. Kind of like the members and some of the members in the jury. I can't remember which number it was. It might have been seven, I think, the one that had the tickets to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, game and all he cared about was really getting out of there and I, I think he cares about doing the right thing but he also really values his time and every one of these characters values something different uh, that's why I just respect is that in a moment like this like like Ashlyn said before the show started being in a jury is extremely important you hold someone's life potentially in your hands and it might not be a death penalty but as you all know in this room that a felony is also crippling to someone's career 
and to their outlook for their life. So, you know, you have a part in that. So it needs to be taken extremely seriously. You know, that reminds me, uh, I, did, I did a little bit of research about uh, indifference uh, before, before this episode, uh, but, I, but I haven't really come to any conclusions. So, so I wanna bring this up, I wanna bring up this question. Do you think indifference could be considered evil in this case? Well, um, actually, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, indifference is one of the greatest evils in my opinion, because I don't know, that there, there, there's the saying the opposite of love's indifference, which is, I think, a very true statement, because if you hate something, at least you have passion about it. If you have indifference, then you're not affecting it one way or the other, and you have no you have no say in what goes on, and just kind of what happens happens, and it makes life sort of a, a flip of the coin or like a dice roll or something. Cody, did you get this inspiration for the question from the the famous book Night, the Holocaust book? Uh. Because doesn't Elie Wiesel, doesn't he, he says something along, because in, in the book he says, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Indifference creates evil. Hatred is evil itself. Indifference is what allows evil to be so strong, what gives it power. I wish I could say I had a thought of night before you mentioned it, but that is a really good reference. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I, I, I love your question, by the way. I, I love the fact, because what a better place to bring up indifference than in a movie about a jury. I just wanted to add about indifference is that in a courtroom, in a jury, we really don't have the luxury of being indifferent. We are put on the spot and you are made to make a decision uh, what you believe or not, even if that means hanging a jury. But in real life, when we're talking about indifference, you have to ask, ask yourself why are they indifferent or even ask yourself why are you indifferent what are you avoiding what facts or what emotions are you avoiding in order to make a decision in your head if you think something's right or wrong or what should and should not happen cody can i ask a devil's advocate question to all three of you it's mainly going to be towards colton a little bit to ashlyn but i guess this is a good time to bring up morality a little bit I'm, i feel kind of crossed i don't feel indifferent about indifference but i feel kind of crossed on how i feel on this i, I I don't know really what to say for my answer. So I guess what I want to know first is to go back to what Colton said earlier. Do you believe to be indifferent in society in a very social fabric society, society that we have, but especially like Ashlyn said in a legal setting where we have an obligation as a U.S. citizen to serve jury time. It's, it's got to be taken seriously. Would you consider being indifferent to be immoral Colton? In that setting? Yes. I think, because you're specifically called upon in a jury setting to have an opinion and if you are indifferent then you are denying the sort of you're 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 denying what you've been called to do and so you haven't done the job that you've been asked to do by being indifferent you know that 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 makes me think of a character that we really don't see uh in this movie and that is the judge in this case all in fact all you see out of the judge is the very beginning when He's instructing the jury members to uh, carefully deliberate, deliberate their decision, or, or sorry, to carefully deliberate their decision. <laughs> yeah, he does talk so lazily. It's almost like he gives off that he is indifferent <laughs> in that part, isn't it? Exactly. I, uh, um, I want to hear what Ashlyn has to say about the indifference thing. I know that you, yeah, I want to hear what Ashlyn has to say about that. So in difference in the courtroom, I mean, it's not just that you're called there and that you have a right and a duty to be up there to make a decision, but it's also you are sitting feet from the defendant and you can see, especially in a case like this with the child, you can see his eyes and just the innocence that you're kind of denying your hum humanity to him, your empathy. And it's not just, you know, denying your duty, it's denying, denying your empathy and your care for another human being. And I think that's why we have this in our justice system is the people decide because we are people, we are the same as whoever's sitting on that stand. That reminds me of another character that uh, 
that you wouldn't normally uh, think of uh, when you're when you're discussing the movie, and that's uh, juror number six. Uh, so, I'm, you can't really think of anything that uh, makes him stand out from makes him stand out among the crowd, except when he when he and uh, juror number eight are in the bathroom and and you know juror, juror number eight uh says suppose that you are wrong about this and the and juror number six responds by saying well i'm not really good at supposing i usually leave that to my boss but suppose that you really do convince us that the boy is not guilty and he turns out he is guilty so that so that sort of reminds you that sort of reminds the audience of the stakes of this as well as uh, as well as lays the foundation for another monologue from juror number eight later in the movie i think that that's that's an inherently flawed way of thinking i'll let you say whatever you're going to say in a minute ashlyn but um <laughs> that jurors um I think that thought's a flawed way of thinking because the court system is innocence until proven guilty. So the question isn't, the question should never be, what if he gets away? It should be, what if we, you know, what if we nailed the wrong guy? I, I, I agree with you, but wouldn't that, wouldn't that thought run through their minds still? It doesn't seem to be for most of the jurors. I would say, especially number three, and that's what we're dealing with the whole movie is, he even claims he wants to push the button on the, or pull the switch on the electric chair for the kid, which is an insane thought, but yeah. No, a lot of these jurors are more focused on, we have to put him away or else, you know, he'll do something bad again, or like, we have to get him even, we have to make sure that he's guilty, yeah. whereas, Juror number eight is focused on the way the system is supposed to work. I do think that all of the jury members want to do the right thing. However, as I believe Ashlyn would agree, what is the right thing is often skewed for all of the 12 jury members. And I think that's what kind of makes it so fascinating. Um, you know, Colton brings up a good point. But I will admit, Coden, Cody brought up probably one of my favorite parts in the entire movie. I can't remember if that was in the second act or right before, right at the beginning of the third act. I mean, that's, that's a huge part because Cody says it reminds the audience, like, well, what, what happens if, if we do say that someone is not, like, innocent? But that, that's the thing is that we go back to jury number eight never said that the boy was innocent. He just doesn't know for sure. It's possible that these things could be a coincidence and he just doesn't think there's enough evidence and as Colton you would agree it's the court's job it's the jury's or I'm sorry it's the attorney's job to provide sufficient enough evidence to leave no doubt and you, you can't deny that there's doubt here and as much as the the evidence seems very assertive at the beginning there's still a lot of doubt and what I love about this movie again the spoiler alert thing even in the end of the movie and when I did this movie in my classes we still don't know if the kid really did it he could have really killed his dad, and we still don't actually know. I think that's what I really love about the movie. But Coden has a point, though. I don't know if it's whose job is it really to feel as though they were immoral or whose responsibility is it to really have done the job correctly if the kid really did it. It's like I always say, Mr. Malkinson, there's a big difference between could do it and did do it. But But I really like that point you brought up. Therefore, I think it's worth asking – this question, how powerful is doubt? And I'd actually like to toss this one to Ashlyn first. Doubt, it's like the domino effect. Once one starts falling, all of them start falling and it turns into a rabbit hole where you just keep getting deeper and deeper in it. And um, the that reason that most of these cases require a unanimous vote is because the prosecution is the one that has the, proof, the burden of proof. That means that they're the ones that are supposed to lay out the evidence and say, here you go, he did it, here's why we think we did it, and you should think that too. And if the jury has a doubt, that means that the prosecution did not do their job to the extent that they were supposed to. And so if there is doubt, then that means that, yeah, there should be, 
because if they did their job correctly or if, if the evidence was there, then there wouldn't have been any doubt. So I think doubt is a, is a good thing uh, which lays, in every uh, setting. Which lays out the uh, falling action for the rest of the movie, I, I suppose. All right, I think but the reason that they have so much doubt is because of the stakes, which later I want to kind of poke and prod at what the death penalty is like during this time. Hey, Colton, based off of Ashlyn's answer, if we go back to doubt, if the prosecution did not adequately remove all doubt from the case, in the end, if the jury lets off a kid that turned out to really have done the crime, wouldn't you still, wouldn't we say ultimately it was the prosecution team, the plaintiff's team's fault for not making it clear enough, as Ashlyn said earlier? Yes, the jury, it, the responsibility does not fall on the jury. The jury's responsibility is to judge the trial, and the prosecution's job is to make sure there's not a doubt in their case. But you brought up a good point, though, because now you almost sound like you're arguing for jury number three, because... That's his whole point with jury number eight in the movie is that it's not our job to interpret, like to over-interpret the evidence beyond the way it was presented. You know what I mean? That That's why I, that jury number three and my favorite character, which Cody, I told you in a text, I think it was jury number four reminded me of both of you and Lewis, one of our, my other former students, because he's the more clear-headed, logical one of the movie. And he, he, he's a big domino to fall later. So I kind of get beyond his bias that jury number three obviously has, he does make a valid point that, you know, he, he starts to think that we're overanalyzing. Him and jury number seven, they think that, you know, jury number eight's trying to make more of than what was actually presented in the evidence. And I think that's the tightrope that jury number, the protagonist number eight, he has to walk this whole movie. And I love how the directors take, the, take time to show these scenes of him, you know, thinking. He, he spends a lot of time with close-ups of him thinking a lot about stuff and walking things out because I think he is trying to prevent from overanalyzing beyond the way the evidence was presented because it's not his, like Colton said, it's not jury number eight's job to present the court case. As Ashlyn said, it's the plaintiff's team. It's the prosecution's job to do that. I think that'll be a good segue into our next quote, if you guys are ready. All right, let's move on. So this next quote uh, was one that I was one that I've been uh, pondering for a while, and it's not it's not one that comes directly from the movie, but I think it is one that does sort of relate to this movie. So the quote is from 1984 by George Orwell. The quote is, "Being in a minority, even a minority of one, did not make you mad. There was truth, and there was untruth." And if you clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. So uh, you know, when uh, juror number nine announces that he's voting not guilty, uh, he explains why. And he explains that juror number eight has been standing alone uh, against 11 other men. And that takes, that takes a lot of guts. So... Um, so, but this automatically indicates that juror number eight is not in a minority of one. So, uh, so what do you what do you two think about this, Cody? I agree with that because for a different reason, though, I argue that he doesn't count as a, as a being on his own, as Orwell says, because he doesn't have the truth. Nobody does. The only person that really knows the truth is the one that committed the murder, and we don't ever find out who that actually is. You know, ju jury number eight is, is acting off of doubt, as Ashlyn said earlier. And we know that there's some truth in th the fact that there's doubt, there's some truth there. But if we're talking about the, the truth of the movie, I would argue that it would be impossible for jury number eight to be what Orwell states in this case, because I would argue jury number eight does not actually have the truth to stand on. What do you think, Ashlyn or Colton? Um, I would like to add that in the movie, and I'm so sorry I forgot which one said this, but one of them said prejudice always obscures the truth. And whether that prejudice is bad, like most of them are saying that they have a prejudice that he's guilty. Um, but even on juror number eight's side, he's kind of dead set that this kid is innocent and he may be looking over what 
the others are saying and it's kind of a back and forth of we should listen to each other but then again they're not listening to each other's truth i like the yeah i like what you say because the reason i like this quote is because it brings up an interesting point i guess just about democracy in general there's a majority and the reason democracy works is because the majority gets what they want but if one person stands alone they probably have a pretty good reason to fight the majority because fighting the majority is hard when you stand alone so if you stand alone you might if somebody stands alone they might have a better reason for doing so than the majority have for standing against the one because it's very easy to stand against the one but it's incredibly difficult to stand against the majority i think that's just i like this quote a lot and i think the numbers yes i like this quote a lot and i think it's it's an interesting sort of perspective on just our system of government in general but just the idea of the majority or the one versus the majority hey it seems like it that all three of you think that he is being kind of a heroic protagonist in this movie that he is standing up for a good reason to as the lone jury member could you three convince me what truth is he standing up for? Because I don't agree with Ashton. I don't agree that he thinks the kid is innocent. He doesn't. He doesn't know if the kid's innocent or not. He just knows that there's a, it's possible that the kid didn't do it. And since it's possible, therefore, there's doubt. So what, what is, if we're going to lay him up against the rubric of what Orwell's quote is, which I love that quote. I think it's great. What is the truth that he's standing on then? The truth that he's standing on is that there is a reasonable doubt. We heard the um, judge say, if you have any reasonable doubt, then do not give him a guilty verdict. And so um, you're right. He didn't know if he was innocent. He didn't believe, but he said, I, one of them said, I want to know more. And I think that was his perspective is I want to know more. I want to see if there is any more doubt or there's any discrepancy that may make him innocent. And that's what he went off of. I definitely oh, they, go ahead, Golden. I I think that's that's right. I think the truth he's standing on is that the evidence he was given is not sufficient. The truth he's standing on is that he needed more convincing to claim that this kid was guilty. He wasn't. He never said that he's not guilty. Well, I, he did say he's. He never said he's innocent. He just claimed that he didn't have enough to convict this kid of murder. I have to admit too that both of you convinced me that, that I'm wrong then. I'm gonna change my original answer because of what both of you said. So you, you've convinced me, and I just wanna make sure I clarify this, that the truth that I should be looking for is not whether the kid did it or not, but the truth is the fact that jury, number, jury member number eight had doubt and that's the truth. And he had a lack of a sufficient use of evidence or sufficient amount of evidence. And that those two in itself are truths. Therefore, he's standing up alone at first as the protagonist kind of hero character based on those two truths. Is it, am I interpreting that correctly? I like it. That's good. It's a really good argument. I think... I like Go ahead. Well, I was going to I think... As far as I go, the, the quote supersedes sort of the, the, the truth aspect in sort of a more of a, a realness sort of standing up against anything for whatever cause. If you stand alone, I think it, it means that you must be standing for a good reason or at least a reason that makes sense to you. And we also forget that before even trial happens, there's the viewer dire where the attorneys, the councilmen, they question the potential jury members to pick them and they ask about their biasness or their prejudice and they want to be able to see, especially the defense, is there going to be somebody that overanalyzes what I'm saying, who reads between the lines and fights for this kid? Now, on the prosecution side, they're going to want people that are going to make a quick decision. And you can kind of see when you go through each juror, which side that the, the defense or prosecution wanted on that jury. And I think that 
it plays a role in this too. That's something that we may overlook. I think that's a really good point, Ashlyn. I hadn't thought of that, but you really can tell which side each one is is sort of fighting for. You can almost tell which juror each side picked in the jury selection. That's a good point. Except for one, I think. Like when we go back to the word indifferent earlier, which number, I think it's maybe it's 11 or 12, which is the guy that only all he does is he brags about his own corporate experiences he doesn't seem to be he see daydreams a lot is it 12 yeah it because is. he sits right next to the foreman of the jury that guy i think that he is easily swayed and he obviously is there he's very narcissistic and he gets egocentric and, and whatnot i for me he was he's probably my least interesting character of the whole movie i don't know why but i just hate that guy i don't know why i do so with regard to the foreman juror number 12 sort of looks like the teacher's pet, wouldn't you say? And so would, yeah, and would. so, and so would juror number two. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, jury number two is pretty easily swayed himself. Um, he, he seems a little bit logical, but he he does kind of vote a little bit more emotionally. He kind of goes with the flow as it goes. When everything starts, the dominoes start to fall. Those guys seem like they they're more likely to switch their vote. But well, I would say that that was. That was done on purpose, though. If you, you would want, if you thought that you had a sure case, you would want someone who was easily swayed on your jury, right? So I would, I would almost say that that makes him more liable to be chosen by the prosecution, that he is yeah. that easily swayed. And don't forget that in a jury selection process, you're going to get both teams getting a chance to choose that jury. So you got six and six. Code, you make a really good point there is that, of course, the, the, the jury member number two and number 12, more than likely, if, I, if I'm selecting them, like if we all had to pick right now, who do you think picked those jury members? you think the prosecution did or the defense? I, could, the I bet the prosecution, because they probably saw, hey, this seems like a relatively easy person. I didn't even think of it like that, Colton. That was a really good point. And attorneys are able to challenge or strike down and, you know, a challenge can be denied by a judge if it's not sufficient enough. And it kind of makes you wonder which of these jury members was challenged against by either side and which ones kind of stayed on by thread. That would have been something that I would have liked to have seen in this movie if they, if they had time. So what do we know about, uh, what do we know about the kid's uh, lawyer? You hear, you hear a lot about, uh, about the defense attorney uh, from conversations among the jury members, but but he's the one main character that you never actually see. And you hear that he he was the attorney who likely didn't want the case. He likely he was likely assigned to the to a client that he didn't believe in. Exactly. Uh, so so what do you what do you all think about? the attorney well looking at it from like working for an attorney that gets appointed cases not to this type of severe magnitude but does get appointed cases sometimes it is a headache because it's just like oh my gosh i have all odds against me we might as well make it the best for this kid and have him plead guilty and do a plea bargain or something like that and there are attorneys out there that they just want to get it over with I don't want to go really much into it. At the same time, there are attorneys that are appointed cases that go full throttle into it. And so what I'm getting about this defense attorney is that he tried to work with the best he could, but he kind of went in knowing, yeah, this kid's probably going to be put in jail because of this. I have to say, I wish we could have seen the defense attorney's reaction at the end, whenever the not, not guilty verdicts read, I'm sure he would have been really surprised at that point. I agree with Ash, and I think that more than likely that attorney probably felt like the kid was going to lose the case. And I'm sure that he was trying to look for some type of a plea bargain one night. Again, kind of like the judge, doesn't seem like the most terribly motivated person, or at least like their heart necessarily is not into it. And that's not necessarily their obligation to be emotionally involved into that. But I guess I just, I hate to bring up that word, but I kind of feel indifferent about the defense attorney. You know that a teenage boy is not going to be able to avoid his, his own attorney. 
And like you said, Cody, a very, very valuable point for all the listeners that go to watch that movie is keep in mind, this isn't a time to kill. Have you guys ever seen that movie? Or Matthew McConaughey and Samuel L. Jackson? Like, this kid isn't getting Matthew McConaughey to defend him like the way Samuel L. Jackson did in that movie. So to be honest with you, that's what I love about this movie, as Cody brought up at the beginning, is that this movie is a focus on the jury. I don't think they really wanted a powerful defense lawyer. And it's really just to show that struggle and as Ashlyn said earlier, really getting to know all 12 of these jurors and seeing what their biases are and what they might be uh, flawed. Because to be honest with you, juror number eight, he has to really, one by one, he has to peel back all of these layers of every one of these individual characters. And even though, I mean, there's not explosions, there's not action or violence, but I just feel like I'm on the edge of my seat and I'm captivated as a viewer the whole movie and it, it just makes this movie timeless and to see those kind of things because these issues still exist if i remember correctly this movie uh for this movie the actors weren't given any stage directions all they were given were lines to read which means everything you see is is what they would naturally do if they were actually jurors that's a really right. good point So uh, let's see. With that, I think we're going to take a quick break and move on to our second segment, which which has uh, questions that we would like to ask each other. So we'll be right back, folks. All right. And the first segment, uh, let's see. It should just work if I hit the record button again. Yeah, if you just hit record again. Are you doing recording on Audacity or do you just keep your recording going? Yeah, I'm doing it on Audacity. Okay, yeah. All right, so in three, two, one. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Movie Brothers. Uh, We're talking about 12 Angry Men and now we're moving into our second segment in which we answer questions based on the movie. So, Colton, would you um, care to give the first question? Well, before we get to our the questions we wrote down, I want to discuss one that we were briefly talking about in the break the um, the sort of the directing choice of making the the setting a hot setting in in New York of all places. Um, and Mr. Malcolmson had some thoughts about that, and Ashlyn had some thoughts about that as well. I can Wait, see. So let's I, I just posed the question. I actually was really interested in what you three first. If you don't mind, I want to see where where you three go with it first, because I, I remember bringing the question up. Ashton, you definitely look like you're ready to say, and I know Colton, you said on the break that you wanted to, to talk about this. So Ashton, what do you think about why they chose it to be so hot and humid throughout the movie? I think personally, it's to show the dysfunctionality of the government. I mean, I know we always say, like blame the government on things that are we think is wrong or slow, but I've experienced just how slow and difficult sometimes the court can be, and I'm sure that they spend a long day of people going back and forth, probably yelling at each other, very difficult to deal with, and they're just like, oh my god, now we got to do this, and so I'm sure the bailiff was probably difficult to deal with, and it's just showing just the hostility that, that's in it and the irritation that they're feeling, and so it kind of gives that sense of let's just get it over with. You know, that reminds me of another, uh, another literature reference, and that is uh, The Great Gatsby. Uh, one, of the, one of the chapters of uh, the book occurs on the hottest day of the year, uh, which represents, which you would think would represent fun and uh, being outdoors, but uh, what it really represents, what it really represents, is uh, uh, high tension between the characters and uh, and not and not and a like Ashlyn said, a dysfunctional uh, experience. I definitely, um, I definitely agree with both of you, but I, I, I'm looking at it from more of like an art perspective, I guess, as it represents. I guess, like you said, like tension. They mentioned it's the hottest day of the year. They're about to have a like a heated discussion, as we'd say. But I think that's that's the idea of it being hot and sweaty. Everyone's irritable because of that, but also it's sort of a symbol for that. And as we progress through the acts, you see the different sort of changing of, of the weather reflect 
the intensity of the conversation, how there's a storm, um, what, when there's the upset, whenever the jury's finally split half and half, it's stormy, it's raining cats and dogs outside. And then when they finally all turn over to the, to the side of juror number eight, it's sunny outside again. It turns out to be a beautiful day. I like that because I like how you took an aesthetic approach to the whole thing. I was going to use the word symbolism too. I think it was rather symbolic. And I like how you said like the the daytime to the storm to the, the daytime again. It's kind of like it flows with the storyline. And whenever the storyline's rather rocky, the weather or the temperature kind of also reflects that. It never cools off, like gets like icy cold or nothing, but you can definitely tell that it's a little bit more tolerable by the end. I think all of you are right. It, it adds to the tension of the movie, but I do like uh, Colton's aesthetic approach to explaining it. All right, so are we ready to move on to the next question? All right, so the next, so the next question is, how do our experience influence our outlook on people or outside situations? And while I was writing down this question, I kept thinking of a very famous quote from uh, the famous mathematician and philosopher Rene Descartes, who said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And I, I don't think he meant, I don't think Descartes meant think like we, uh, have come to know the term. I think uh, Descartes meant experience. Like, I have experiences, therefore I am real. Uh, uh, do you think, do you guys think that quote ties into this question? For sure, I think so. Yeah, it can, especially since this quote relates to reason or rational rationalism, especially when we're talking about a movie that involves jury members and we're talking about outside things that may affect us in society. Now, Cody, are you asking this question in regards to the contemporary world or are we, are we comparing this question to the film? Uh, both actually. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up something that is very different for that jury than let's say a jury now that I think is very appropriate for right now is that the death sentence didn't have such a severe negative connotation as it does today. Just think about it. When, when, did, when did this film come out? 1957, I think. So roughly 20 years earlier in 1936 was the last public execution. Do you guys know where that was? Was, was that in Durable? It was in Owensboro, Kentucky. It was a public <laughs> hanging and over 20,000 people showed up. And so that was when Kentucky said, oh, no, we can't make, we can't glorify this. So you got to think about the people at that time and the death penalty. It was kind of glorified a little bit. And um, they also had different w ways to do it, the electric chair and the hanging. And so it's a little bit different. And I think that's also why it was a very hard for juror number eight to convince them to not vote have them not vote as guilty because they're just like well the kids go in the death penalty eh. it seems to me that I, I i can really argue either way for the death penalty uh you know on one sense on one hand uh you know so this this boy kills his father he goes to prison uh or he go he is sent to his death well well, who kills the guy who sends him in, into his death? Well, who kills him? And so on. Uh, because an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. But at the same time, it seems to me that you can't hold the state to the same standard as, as the individual. So, so uh, I don't know. What do you... What do well, you guys think? I do want to add in there, Ashlyn, this goes back to that original topic that we brought up at the beginning about the value of the individual, especially over the course of the 20th century. But even before that, we've seen the value of a human being, the, the way it's, the, a human being is thought of throughout society and the world has shifted and changed so much over time. And that's why you discuss how just even the way we do executions today are way less glorified and way less public than it used to be before, because I think that we take death maybe a little more seriously because 
the value of the human life is taken more seriously, at least in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I, I do think, Cody, if you don't mind, just kind of bring us back to that question that you had asked originally earlier too, and you do bring up Descartes. I, I do think Descartes relates to it. If we, we get into this situation about reason or rationalism, I do think the reason works as long as you believe that our past experiences and things that we're exposed to help us gauge those kind of things. I think without any kind of past experience, well, what is your compass? Well, what, what are you gauging things on? So if we go back to the movie in general, I know Ashlyn and Colton both brought this up earlier in the show too, is every one of these characters are complex in their own different ways. But we, we definitely see, especially in juror number three, that his own way that he treated his son, his own problems in the past led to that way. Juror number 10, his own bigotry, his own prejudice towards other people over time. But I, I have to say with your original question about do these experiences shape us? Of course they do. If you want to look at psychological or philosophical terms, look at tribalism. So to grow up in a group of any kind or any kind of society, you're more than likely to be there. Look at where all three of you grew up at. So all three of you grew up in Logan County, Kentucky. So, you know, it's a relatively conservative agricultural based community. You're, you're more than likely going to be Christian in regards to religion, more than likely, or you're more than likely going to have conservative values because of where you grew up at. doesn't mean for sure you would, but obviously if you change your setting as you guys go to college or somewhere else, is that subject to change? Could you, I mean, Colton just got back from governor scholars. Could you go out, travel the world, meet new people, be around certain things, discover things for yourself. And those experiences, could they change the way you three think about your morals, your values, the way you view the world, the way you view human beings? For sure. I think so. Yeah. I think even I, I spent a week at um, Center College in Danville and even just that week going there and having that experience and coming back, I can already tell like a huge difference, just things like I'm not a hermit or anything like I, I've, I've been places, but going there alone for a week and just sort of a week of self-discovery, I guess, and then coming back, it's been sort of an interesting, it's been, I don't, I don't exactly know the words that I'm trying to think of, but it is, I can, I can definitely. Has it been uh, enlightening to you in a way? In a way. Not necessarily yeah. like intellectually enlightening, but enlightening in a way that has affected you intrinsically somehow in the way you view things. Yes. And I think that's why it's so hard to be part of a jury is because the justice system is asking the jury to do something very difficult. Take your personal self and what your beliefs are and use them, but at the same time, use the law and take away your biasness and your personal experiences. It's a very fine line that is very hard to walk. And we see each one of these jury members, even number eight, struggle with that inclusion, but also separation of ourself and our experience. That the sort of question I wanted to raise now that just occurred to me is, do you think that all of the jurors are prejudiced in some way and if our experiences make up who we are and make our decisions and influence our decisions, that is, do you think that all of the, like even juror number eight is prejudiced? And do you think that's why he acted the way he did because of his prejudice? I wouldn't say the prejudice, maybe just experience and each one of their backgrounds. Like you have one that number five, I think that came from the exact same background and that's how he, went about it and maybe that swayed him a little bit but then you go on the other end and you have a senior citizen that's a little bit more wiser than the others that they're saying he's kind of like well let, let me see what this other guy has to say and so I think that maybe experience more than prejudice kind of swayed them. I also think juror number eight seems to be rather optimistic he seems like a little bit more, whereas juror number four is that logical one that doesn't get emotional, doesn't sweat or anything like that. I do feel like that's what makes him so relatable. In a way, I mean, Colton, the way you're asking the question, it does make it sound like you believe that every one of us are prejudiced in some way. 
And I don't necessarily mean prejudice towards like race, but we have certain things that we're ignorant on. I do believe that we're all ignorant and those things can come out in multiple forms, whether it's optimism, um, real, realism or prejudice or, or oppression or whatever they might be. I do think we all have some kind of prejudice. I just don't know what to tell, what to say for juror number eight. I don't know what kind of prejudice he would be labeled as, whereas some of the other ones have a little bit more obvious. You know, I'm like, juror number 10 is very obviously anti-Italian immigrant and, and basically anti-immigrant in general. Um, and he's more of a nativist in a way, um, but they all have their own kind of like issues. But is that the point though? Is juror number eight supposed to be more like the everyman archetype again, that we don't really know what he is. He's just a little bit of all of us within the movie. I think, yeah, I think maybe I, I the way I've phrased it, I feel like maybe I understand better now. I think I was misusing uh, prejudice instead of, I was mistaking prejudice for experience, I guess, which I think experiences lead to prejudice, maybe. And ignorance, yeah. maybe a combination of experience and ignorance lead to prejudice. But I think maybe that was the question I was trying to ask is our experiences lead to our sort of decisions. And so they've, everyone in that sort of, everyone in that room had experiences that caused them to act the way that they did. Yeah. Colton, um, think, just to clarify my answer, I say yes. I, I, I say yes to your original answer too, that we all have prejudice. However, I think when I said in the chat that Ashlyn hit the nail on the head, I think that we all have prejudice today and all of the actors in the movie, all the characters in the movie do. But as Ashlyn said, when you're in that setting, in a courtroom, in a jury, and you have the law, it is our obligation and duty to try to look past our prejudice, past some of our biases, and try to be as clear and concise as we can. That, does that kind of sum up what you were kind of saying earlier, Ashlyn, or am I hitting too far off base? No, no, you're, you're right. You know, the, you see the, in uh, juror number eight's opening remarks, you hear him say that he kept uh, putting himself in the boy's shoes. He kept asking himself what he would have done if he were on trial. And he said he would have asked for another lawyer. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Uh, the boy, uh, the boy was not exactly given the best lawyer. So, uh, crap! I forgot what I was. I was just say. doing some research while you were doing that, Cody. Real quick, I was just kind of looking at some research because the the boy is obviously. Um, I would say lower class or at least working class from like his background, his family. I don't know if there's even really a mother figure involved. I don't know if it was his dad that raised him by himself. But you said earlier about the main protagonist, juror number eight, said that if it were me, I would have asked for a different lawyer. And I didn't really know from my own background, if you're assigned a lawyer by the state, are you allowed to request another lawyer? And it turns out you can. So of course, a teenage boy probably doesn't have knowledge or and nobody's around to really assure them. But legally, you can request another lawyer to be assigned to you. So at least it's a reasonable request that juror number eight says. And that's what um, inspires me most about our justice system is that our human nature and our experiences that influence our decisions can either help, but it can also hinder a trial as well. You can have a jury full of people that just wanted to get it done um, because they're irritated, they're hot, they, they're tired. Um, but I actually would rather have a group that base their experiences off their decision because you're always going to have that one that relates to the defendant. And I think that, like I said, that's very inspiring about our justice system. Another good story to relate to that, Ashlyn, is To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, look at that famous story. You, you talk about jury of your peers. We, we all know that that's BS in that, in that story about how, and again, you said it too, Ashlyn, those people's experience and their personal tie to who that family was, the, the, you know, the defendant doesn't even stand a chance. But if we go back in the world history, the jury of our peers is not always going to be beautiful. It's not always going to be I, ideal, but I guess it's better than having an emperor or a king or a pope 
or somebody like that as the sole jury member that you have. So it's weird. It's, it's like democracy. It, it, it's beautiful, but it's not always going to be beautiful. Sometimes it's going to be, be pretty ugly. And with that, I think we're ready to move on to our next question. So the next question is, was the boy given a fair trial? And we've kind of we've kind of hit on this throughout the episode, but I think this is where we can really uh, we can really uh, compile uh, all all the evidence we've gathered so far. So, uh, Ashley, what do you think? Do you think the boy was given a fair trial? My answer is I don't know. I didn't see the trial. I didn't see how the judge acted and what he allowed. I didn't see the prosecution and how they handled the defense in their cross-examination. Like I said, we really don't know much about the defense lawyer as well. And so that, and also um, comparing from 1957 until now, there are a lot of laws made between them that guarantees a fair trial compared to 1957. If I was going to make a guess, I would probably say no, just because of the circumstances. But like I said, I don't really know. I would uh, I would agree with you, Ashlyn, that I would like to know a lot more about the trial to make a call on this. But just guessing, I would say no, based on what the jury members say about the defense lawyer. Because I think one of the most crucial things to ensure a fair trial is the defense attorney. I mean, of course, there are other things that play into it, like the, the judge's ruling and things like that. But I think a defense, a good defense attorney is what makes it a fair trial. Mr. Malcolmson, you have a club. What do you think? Just to be a devil's advocate, I'm going to try to argue that it was fair. Um, from the lack of information we were given, all the, I can, I'm going to argue that all we can assume is that it was a fair, fair trial and whether to judge if it was fair or not, let's just look at the Bill of Rights. Did the trial meet the standards of what the Bill of Rights and the Constitution request? And I think it does. It does. It is a fair trial. It's a relatively speedy trial. You, you do have lawyers assigned to you. If we go back into what Jocko Willick, a famous podcaster, says about extreme accountability, ultimately it's, it's on the defense attorney to ethically do as best as he or she can at representing that person. But as far as the law goes, I think that the laws were followed. And I think that the standards of the courtroom uh, was followed, the docket was followed, and then the jury was. And luckily the jury made the right decision based off of the doubt and the evidence and the way it was presented. So I would say based off of the information we were given, it seems to meet the standards that our constitution requires for it to be a, um, an adequate trial. Uh, if we're going to throw the Bill of Rights in there, um, isn't it number eight that guarantees no cruel, unusual punishment uh, mm -hmm. on a minor? And he's definitely a minor. The death penalty that is mandatory, that's cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, even there was a federal Supreme Court ruling saying that that was cruel and unusual punishment in the 70s, but still at this time, I think that it is pretty unfair for the prosecution to go after capital punishment instead of a long time in prison with no parole. I think I'm going to just, he, I think he's 18 in the movie. So not technically a minor, but he's still, he's still a young boy. Um, mm -hmm. Or at least a young man. Yeah. So, but I'm going to disagree with you too, Malcolmson, because <laughs> I think maybe by the books, the trial was adequate. But that doesn't mean it was a morally fair trial. That doesn't mean it was a, that doesn't mean it's satisfactory to our standards as human beings. That doesn't, just because by the books and by the law, it says that the trial was quote unquote fair. That doesn't mean that both sides gave great arguments and did the best job that could have possibly been done. And that's why we have people as attorneys and people as judges, and we don't have computers because it's not this and this output comes this. It's we're deliberating, we're going back and forth, and we're saying our side. And that's why I think the justice system should never be, I guess I want to say computerized or main, like mainstreamed because of that reason. I think it was you who once told me, Colton, that witnesses are by far the worst piece of evidence you can you can have in 
you can have in court. Look, look at him nodding. They both agree with me. Oh yeah, he's right. It usually is considered the less, the less credible form of evidence. Because as juror number eight points out, uh, to juror number twelve in particular, but to all of them, that uh, witnesses witnesses can be wrong. And since there were only two witnesses on the prosecution's case, and that was all the prosecution had to go on, there's tons of room for error, and for for a trial that uh, would put a boy on the electric chair, then a testimony should be far more accurate than that. A testimony is really hard to get very right um, in the trial because as time passes, you know, your perception could have changed. You could fully believe what happened happened or a minor detail was there or not there. But that could be incorrect, especially if you start talking to other people that are involved and they start questioning you and you start questioning yourself. It's kind of like by the end, by the trial, you don't have your actual like testimony of what you saw. That is a really good point. And considering the circumstances, I think, wasn't the killing done at night? So that, that yeah. adds a little difficulty to it. The female witness didn't have her glasses even on, right? Yeah, the, in the morning, yeah, real late. And then, uh, so that, that's one of those things, there was too many what ifs. So you do, both of you, all of you make a good point on that. I mean, the way that the prosecution used the two wit eyewitnesses as like concrete rock hard evidence to say that this young man committed murder, that, that's pretty sketchy. But Did I still even... argue that's not the court's job to submit that. Wouldn't it be the, um, God, what am I thinking of? I, I'm having a brain fart right now. I should know as the law club guy. Um, when, the, when the jury members meet, it's the uh, larger version of the jury. They meet to decide if the prosecution has enough. Thank you. Why can I not remember that on the top of my head? So I don't know for a case like this, they would have had a grand jury proceeding where they, the prosecution would have shown the evidence that they had, and then the grand jury of usually 29 or so would decide to take it. It can be taken to trial. I don't know about you, but if 29 people are sitting in a room and you, you saw this evidence and the, the, the two eyewitnesses have that sketchy of an answer, that, that does seem broken. And that goes back to Colton and Ashlyn arguing that it isn't a fair trial because that means that that's more than just the lawyers. That means that the system could be broken on the way it's interpreted. So good, good point. Good job, Cody. And this also makes me question the ability of the defense attorney because if that defense attorney, when he cross-examined these witnesses, did not immediately start questioning and making the jury members doubt their integrity, then what was he doing? You know, it's kind of like, what did he ask? Why didn't he try to bring up these things? And um, why didn't that come out of the jury's mouth? At least more than one of them saying, well, he did say, well, she didn't have her glasses or this guy was older and it was where the visibility wasn't great. I will, I will say this, Ashlyn. Uh, well, the, when they're testing uh, whether the old man really could get downstairs in 15 seconds, uh, juror number eight points out that uh, perhaps the lawyer didn't uh, ask him a certain question is because it, it would have meant bullying and badgering a helpless old man, and that doesn't sit well with the jury. Uh, so so uh, what, what does that tell you about the defense attorney? That's still a bunch of what ifs. I mean, I can kind of agree if you're sitting there badgering an old man about what he saw, that doesn't sit well. But um, at the same time, too, if I was the defense attorney or I was working with the defense attorney, I would at least, without badgering or being too much, kind of subtly put the, the doubt and kind of bluntly put out there that he may not be as credible as the prosecution would like you to think. Ashlyn brings up a great point because it's the lawyer's job to to artfully cross-examine someone and not come across as badgering. It's weird because it, it almost seems like juror number eight should have been the lawyer, the defense attorney for the young man. But he brings up a good point. I think that you could have called out the doubt on the old, the elderly man and of the young woman with, that didn't have her glasses on in the courtroom because I think that she she was more – she'd been more prone. If I, if I remember him mentioning, she could have been more prone to, to embellish or sensationalize under oath because – 
she wanted to be more famous or well known or be you know being in a public setting like that. I think that you can cross examine and defend your client because that's your freaking job and not worry as much about your image and do it in a way that is not badgering. But I, Cody, you still bring up a good point, and it was in the movie that was a real concern that you don't you don't want to come off as badgering. But I guess for me, when you have a human being's life at risk, you have to risk that. I mean, somebody's life is weighing in on it. So you have to risk trying to do it, as Ashlyn said, as, as carefully as you can and strategically as you can not to come across as badgering. I have a follow-up question. So so you you mentioned that, you know, juror number eight very well could have been his uh, defense attorney if he wanted to, but uh, but you learned that juror number eight was actually an architect uh, what's the significance of uh, that position to this story? So, like, him being an architect and what importance that is? Exactly. Okay. I think the importance of that one is that, one, um, he is educated. He had to have an education to get, get that job. And um, that in itself, when you are in more classes, you learn to think more and you will learn to question even if you're not in political science classes and I think that plays in it too but also he's not in a job that requires him to be analytical and I mean you have to pay attention to detail but it, you're not tearing something apart and I think that, that it's outstanding that a man like this who doesn't do this for a living comes out right out the gate questioning the evidence that is there. I think that brings up uh, Malcolmson's point of the, the everyman, just to, because if he was a political scientist, like if he was an attorney or something, um, then you would expect that out of him. But the fact that he's an architect and has like, I, I wouldn't say like a regular job, but not a job where those skills aren't used as much makes him more of a sort of baseline character that everyone can sort of relate into. No, I'll agree with Ashton on the deconstruction part. But on the flip side, an architect constructs. An architect pays attention to detail. If we go back, like when you're talking about, remember the scene where he literally walks out where the old man's bed was and he was laying down and how he'd go to the door? This screams architect. And I, th I think that his character, much like many of those jury members, their job really did relate, like, tie into how they were like juror number four wasn't he the uh he worked for like a financial firm like the stock market so he yeah yeah and he, because he tended to be more logical or more analytical as like Ann would say he was more that guy but i do think that he you know that job as an architect you have to be able to pay attention to detail you you have to be able to construct things you understand why the foundation of things are so important I think that it's a perfect job to give the character of juror number eight. All right, so I think we're ready to move on to the next question. So the next question is uh, one that's been on my mind for a while now. So the question is, why does juror number five not give a reason for voting guilty in the very beginning? So at the very beginning, the after after they find out that juror number eight is the only one who doesn't know if if the boy is guilty, then and then the foreman the foreman suggests to juror number eight, you know, let us know what you're thinking and we'll show you where you're mixed up. And that the way you phrase that, it, that really told told a lot about not just him but all the characters, especially after juror number 12 remarks that it seems like it's up to us to convince this man that he's wrong and we're right. So, uh, so then they all go around, uh, go around the table and give their reason for uh, voting the way they did. You know, juror number two says, I just think he's guilty. Juror number three, uh, uh, gives the reasons. So does juror number four. But juror number five he says something that's really telling of him. Can I pass? Well, you have to think of the background of juror number five. And I literally wrote down for juror number five, 
the kid as an adult because he comes from roughly the same background and so that speaks a lot about the kid as well because if he's from the same background and he knows what it's like to live in a rough area he he's probably thinking in the back of his mind that yeah it's plausible for for a community like that it's plausible for a kid in his situation like that he he's thinking that it's not too far of an assumption t to say that it's him I agree with you, Ashlyn. I do think there's a little bit more layers that we could peel back about juror number five, too. I think that there's a part of him that doesn't want to be ostracized. Obviously, he does have that ancestry that's more immigrant-based. He can tie. He relates to this kid in a certain way. But that uncertainty that he displays at the onset of them going around and defending the reasons why, I think that it shows that he's in kind of a conundrum in his mind. I think that he does see, as you said earlier, Ashlyn, that the evidence does seem like pretty obvious at first that maybe this kid did do it, but there's another side that something's telling him that something's off, something's not right. Um, I think that's why in the end he realizes, um, especially after juror number 10 goes on the big racist rant the whole time, I think he, he realizes that the, there is doubt there and that people can easily take their like uh, bigotry or biases against certain types of people and use that against them. I think that's, that's really what pushes juror number five over the edge and eventually over to the not guilty part. I think that he was just in a, in a kind of a tug of war in his mind over that whole time because he had a, an emotional attachment, but in the complete opposite way that juror number three had. You know, juror number three has this anger about him and 10 has the anger and bigotry, but he's almost like, I relate too much to this kid. I got to be really careful about whatever I, I rule on it here because I, I see myself in this, this uh, young man in a way. I think something that sort of feeds into this is the, the scene right before where they all take the vote. And it's, a, it's a public vote. They don't like write it. It's not secretive in any way. But it's a public vote. And you see some hands shoot straight up for guilty. And then after, you know, a few seconds pass, everyone else but jury, but juror number eight um, raises his hand or doesn't raise his hand. And, and, I and think juror it, number five is one of those who waits a few seconds. Yeah, I think it's important to notice the, all the members of the jury who had to wait to see what everyone else voted yeah. for them. Hey, Colton, I don't think that we can also overlook one of the most, most famous scenes of the movie. There's several we've yet to mention the knife scene which of course you know the famous stab in the table and them talking but this is where jury jury member number five i think really shows his true colors in the movie in a positive way because you, know, you have to correct me if i'm getting this mixed up because it's, it's been a little bit since i saw the movie but when they when they compare those knives doesn't juror number five doesn't he either hold the knife or talks about that when he was younger he used to do those knife fight kind of things too as a kid so he knows how to use those knives and he argues that if this kid had this experience with a knife, he wouldn't have stabbed his dad the way he did. The way his dad was stabbed was a very reckless kind of way. And he even told about how I think he was stabbed from below or was he stabbed from above? Stabbed was from above, and yeah. And he says yeah. that whenever you would fight as young men, you would always stab like this from the bottom. And since the boy is shorter than his father, it doesn't really make sense why he'd stab him from above. I'll bet. And I think it's shortly after that where you, where you do see him. It was either right before or right after that where you see him flip and turn to not guilty. And that's where I really commend that juror for that is because he had a really crucial role in that moment. Um, he could have sat quiet and not showed his experience and let them all believe that it's possible for this kid to stab the man as he was. And so he took it upon himself and he showed his compassion and his empathy and he spoke out, even though that he may have been ridiculed for it. And I really, I really enjoyed watching somebody like that um, kind of come to the rescue for that kid. I will say this. Juror number five was actually one of the first to change his vote to not guilty. Uh, in fact, that's long before the stab scene. Uh, in, fa in fact, uh, the one who changes his vote after that scene is juror number seven, the one who doesn't want to be there because he wants to go to the baseball game. And he only changes his vote because, you know, it's, it's completely split now. And, you know, he wants to get out of there as quickly as he can. So, 
so he just changes he just changes his vote for no better reason than that. What do you got? What do you guys think of him? I really enjoyed that scene that you were just describing because then one of the other jurors snap back and say, "Well, don't just vote that way because you want to get this over with," and that really shows the true respect for the defendant and also the justice system because if you're just going to vote one way or the other then we should have left it to the to a judge and so it like I said it really shows that respect and um, I think that was a really good point made by one of the jurors. I have to state that in a personal way I know I didn't have Colton in my class as a student but I've seen him do this before in law club I've definitely seen Ashlyn you and Cody do this and that's why I, I find that character number seven so frustrating. But the rest of them, especially eight, doesn't allow him to get off so easy with this. It's kind of like certain kids in the class that you can tell are saying yes or no to something or just to agree just for the sake of doing it. But they don't really have a justified, concrete reason why. And I would often see all three of you ask them why or devil's advocate on there. I, I, I like that kind of character because that's where that indifference thing comes in again too because what juror number seven values more than anything is his time. So he's willing to do anything he can to get the time that he had originally planned off of there. But I like how they hold his feet to the fire metaphorically. I like how they, they really try to make him defend himself. So I agree with Ashlyn. I like that, that sort of scene because um, it shows – I think the movie's brilliant because every juror sort of has their moment once they switch over to the to the not guilty party. They all have a sort of moment of, and you, you know their characters before they get to it, but that's sort of moment the defining of moment catharsis. of, right, that's it's sort of the defining moment of juror number seven, where you know, you knew how he was before, but I don't know if he says pretty much another word throughout the rest of the film. He's... Uh, that's sort of that's his big moment where he plays i i guess he he metaphorically shows his hand and then he's out that's another interesting message in this film there are no there are no small actors there are just small roles and every actor has one scene in which they can show who they who their character really is I think a lot of that can be seen through an art lens too. It's like a painter with a with a piece, and whether it's on a fresco or whatever it might be, uh, there's nothing that's wasted. There's no wasted space. It, you know, every everything has some kind of meaning to the movie. And and I agree with Colton. I think this movie is phenomenal for how simple the movie is. There's a lot of complexity behind the simple aesthetic look and setting. Uh, are we ready to move on to the next question? I think we are. Or another question? I think. We're going kind of long on time this time. <laughs> so the next question is so the next question is a pretty important question in terms of this movie. What is the significance of juror number eight calling juror number three a sadist? So for context, this scene occurs uh, just after the just after the jurors test out whether the old man really could have made it downstairs in the time he said he did. So, uh, so juror number three says, ah, you know, this is stupid. We're, you're wasting all our time. I mean, what's the matter with all of you? You all know this kid is guilty. You're letting him slip through our fingers. Juror number eight comes back and says, slip through our fingers. Are you his executioner? Juror number three says, I'm one of them. But there's a pause for a second and Juror number eight says, I bet you'd like to pull the switch. You know, I feel sorry for you. Ever since you came in here, you've been acting like a self-appointed public avenger. You personally want to see this kid die, not because of the facts, but because you personally want it. You're a sadist. And then, and then in reference to, another, to a scene from earlier where, uh, juror number three, where juror number three thinks that the boy meant it when he shouted, I'm going to kill you, to his father. Then juror number three charges it, juror number eight, the other jurors have to restrain him. And he shouts, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. And juror number eight responds, you don't really mean you'll kill me, do you? And there's a long pause after that. You can tell that that changed some minds right there. 
It's a very powerful scene, I think. And if you ask me, that juror number eight took a really big risk there, because if you, because if it hadn't worked out the way it did, then juror number eight would have looked like the aggressor, and that and that wouldn't have helped out his case at all. I think that scene happened for two reasons. The first one is the juror eight's reason to do that is to kind of show him and everybody else in that that jury room that you have that they have personal bias and the reason that they're voting guilty is because of their own personal vendettas however the director's reason i believe was to show like in anger you say stuff that you don't really mean and they're trying to show that about the um kid as well i don't think the jury number eight intended on him saying that but it kind of worked out for him you know, the, the beauty behind that whole scene, too, is that there's truth and there's untruth about it. And what I mean is sometimes we yell at people and we say things we don't mean. Sometimes we yell at people and we do what we mean. Like we, we end up, I mean, people get mad. And you've seen stories where people get in arguments over wearing masks and somebody shoots another person. Like it does happen. That's, that's the cool thing is after that argument's over, it does say something about juror number three. And eventually it takes towards the very, very end. But he does have a self-realization moment about who he actually is. And I think deep down he knows he's being a sadist. However, it doesn't alleviate the guiltiness or non-guiltiness of this kid. A kid could say, uh, get mad at his dad and say, I'm going to kill you and just be saying it and it's fine. He also could be yelling it and still want to kill his dad. That's my point, is that not, but, but I get his point. The, the point that juror number eight is making is there's doubt there. You, you can say that and not always really want to kill somebody, but it doesn't mean it's 100% of the time. So even after that scene, we still have the uh, uncertainty, so the suspense is still in the movie. I do disagree with something that Cody said, though. I don't think that juror number eight risked what Cody said he risked because everybody kind of stayed quiet whenever he was calling them all those things and kind of held people back. Because I think deep down, the other juror members knew the guy was being a sadist. They may not have used that terminology, but I think they knew that juror number eight was right, or at least made a point of that. But it might not have worked out the way that he wanted to do it. But I don't think that juror number eight would have came out looking bad, though, if it would have looked that other way. That's the only thing I disagree with. Yeah, to sort of build off of that, I don't think there are any I don't think there's any shame in being the aggressor in this movie because I, it, it's 12 angry men. All 12 of them are angry at some point. That, and maybe juror number eight, going into the movie, because I'd only seen it once before we watched it uh, to prep for the episode, going into the movie, I remember juror number eight as being the calm, level-headed one. And really he wasn't. I, I was surprised myself. There were many scenes where he got very aggravated and very, you know, very angry Should he at some of the other. And I'm not, I'm not saying. I, all I'm saying is that I don't think it was a risk for him to call names because everyone else in the room had been doing that. So I don't think he would have been looked down upon. I, I Maybe he was risking his life and risking getting beat up by juror number three, but I don't, I, Aside from that, I don't know that it was a huge risk. There were two defining things on juror number eight, and, that, and this is one of them, but um, I would like to also speak on that because of a required unanimous vote, if he would have stayed saying not guilty, he could have hung the jury and there could have been a retrial. And I know they mentioned that during deliberation, but the fact that he wanted to push for an innocent verdict kind of speaks levels on him too. Interesting. I think that's a great scene. But I but if you ask me, I think uh the climax, the best scene of the movie, comes in this next question we're gonna talk about. Are you guys ready to move on? All yeah. right, so so this next question is about is all about is the climax of the movie. Why does juror number three finally change his vote to not guilty? So so uh for the entire movie leading up to this, uh, you know that juror number three has uh, has a personal bias against this kid, even though he says he doesn't, uh, because this kid this kid reminds him of his 22 year old son who he hasn't seen in two years, 
when his son was nine years old, he he ran away from a fight, and that embarrassed juror number three. So number three promised to make a man out of him, and and he did. But when he was sixteen, they had a fight, and that that sort of led to the led to the I don't want to say destruction of their relationship, but uh, no, I think that's fair to say. Okay, so, uh, so, so that leads up to this scene, in which juror number three realizes that everyone. Yeah, the connection problem, I think, on uh, Cody's end. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We had a few, we had a little uh, technical difficulty, but we're back now. So, uh, so in that scene, uh, you know, hear about the fight that juror number three had with his son, and uh, after that, he pulls out some notes he had uh, from the trial. And among those notes was a picture of of juror number three and his son, and and then uh, number three looks at it pretty uh, disdainfully and says, "Rotten kids, you work your life out," and rips up the picture. But in that moment, uh, number three has a, a kind of epiphany uh, in which he in which he finally subconsciously or consciously realizes that he doesn't, that he's been uh, discriminating against this kid based on his own personal prejudice. So uh, the question has to be asked, what is it uh, that makes him, what is that epiphany? What is it that makes number three uh, finally realizes the er- realize the error of his ways, and maybe a, a a a better question to ask would be, what is it that makes that scene so powerful? I think what made that scene so powerful is that you can actually see those walls that he built up around his brain come down, and he realizes the root of why he fought it so much. And then it comes a realization that um, everybody's not so different after all. These people that are up on trial that are criminals, they, they're not so much different than a lot of people. Um, and so he's kind of realizing that this kid is human and he should give that human respect and he should, you know, take down his angry walls that are his personal issues. And I I think that's a really great moment because like I kind of mentioned earlier that's what we're asking your jury to do um, and it's a really difficult duty but it's also our right um, and I believe that is such a profound moment because it's when we all kind of with him kind of take our walls down and realize what um, we're here to do. I uh, I def- I I agree that that's why it's such a good moment because you do see him finally break down and realize sort of what he's going through. But it, I want to um, I want to bring up something that I mentioned earlier that I'm starting to think about a little bit more now relating to this when I talked about um, if democracy is great because it's about a majority versus a minority and the, what the majority wants the majority gets. But if one person stands alone, they must have a good reason. And that, the juror number three stood alone for a little while. And in his mind, I guess it was a good reason, but maybe, maybe I'll amend my statement to that. They, in the mind of sort of, I guess you'd say in the mind of the beholder, it's, they have a good reason for standing alone, a really strong reason, but even he broke down towards the end you know it's it's pretty obvious that he is the most you know he's the one that's viewing this entire situation through like a subjective lens or, or a relative lens in a way and 
I think it becomes ever more important as jury number eight knows he almost plays like the psychologist that's doing therapy with someone that's self-defeating that has a lot of anger. He knows the only way for him to, to get to the point where he has self-realization, he's going to have to, to get him out loud to walk himself through all these things that he thinks the reasons why he thinks that someone is guilty. So as he ex expels all those reasons again, I think he starts to see the, the flaw of that. But obviously the aesthetic symbolism of when he throws his wallet on the table and he sees the picture of his son, when he rips up the picture, it, it reminds him yet again of what you all mentioned earlier about the destruction of his relationship with his son. And now he realizes that he's destroying another, a young person, an image of some young person for a reason that's very fatalist and it's very like a hedonist in, almost in a way. And it, it, it takes that moment because it, it's almost like an addict it, it, in a way of a, like someone with an addiction. They, he's, he's like living in denial in a way. And once he's able to realize that, that he is coming through it from a very subjective lens and very biased in that negative way because of this conflict with his son and that anger over there, I think that, then he can finally see where he's flawed at. And it's really curious that if you guys don't mind, I'd love to ask you three a follow-up question, even though it's going to be speculative. It's, it's nothing that's going to be in the movie. I guess I'm saying is if there was hypothetically some kind of a sequel in a way that's not nothing like this first one, but if we, if we could go home with all the other jury members, uh, going back to that experience question earlier in the show, especially juror number three, but all of them, do all of them change the way they view humanity, their own lives, um, justice, morality, do, do they all change or do they leave the courthouse as the same individual they were when they came in? I'd say they change dramatically, uh, especially juror number three. Uh, but, but as juror number eight uh, immediately helps him realize that change is a, is a good thing. And he does that uh, pretty subtly, subtly by uh, helping him by putting on his white jacket and helping uh, number three put on his jacket to show that you know, the world isn't isn't as uh, isn't as bad as you think it is. There is some optimism in the world. There is room for optimism, and uh, and you can start by. Uh, mending that relationship with your son. I'm I'm going to disagree with you, Cody. I think number three is a very dramatic character, and I think he does change. And I would even I would go as far to um, I would go as far to say number ten is also that way, although he doesn't make as dramatic a change as number three. But I think for a large part, a lot of the jurors remain unchanged. I think number eight especially remains un unchanged because he swapped everyone else around to his viewpoint. I don't know. I disagree with that. Well, and so a lot of the other jurors, I think voted because everyone else voted guilty. Like um, who was, was juror number? Number 12, I think. Uh, not because he was the not only 12. one. He was the only one who, who switched back to guilty after after more evidence was provided? Uh, no, I think it was number number 11, maybe, and was number five the... Number five, the five was the... Uh, that was the one that he related to the man, the boy, yes. as a young man. Yeah, I, and then 11 I, is the I, Polish immigrant. Yes, I don't know if they changed. And then I don't know if juror number nine changed either, the older man. But I think some characters changed. I think many of them stayed static, though. I'm not sure. I dis. I'm not sure they stayed that static. I'll disagree there because uh, remember the bathroom scene where number six uh, reminds number eight of the of the stakes that if the, and if they get it wrong, they'll be letting a guilty man go free. And uh, that sort that seemed to that seemed to have some kind of click in uh, number eight's mind because uh, 
because you just need a reminding of the stakes and you later see you later see him acknowledge the stakes uh, and realize and you understand that he's okay if they get it wrong do you think that he left a changed person do you think he left with a different perspective than the one he arrived with though uh well as far as the boy goes beyond the boy uh in that sense i do agree with you okay what do you think ashley i think all of them um, individually have a different reason to come out of that trial different but i think all of them we can agree that when there is an accusation um, whether it's on the news or in their personal lives, that they may give it a second thought. They may say, well, let's sit down and question it for a second and not right off the bat believe everything they say. And I um, think that is a good thing for these people. So what do you what think, do think about What do you all think about the audience? Are we supposed to change? After we sit down and watch this art piece of a film, are we supposed to leave the theater and change? I That's think a good question. Go ahead, Ashley. I think so. I think we're supposed to learn the same lessons that we're talking about these jury members are learning. But I also think, um, especially in these times, that it kind of gives us um, a good light on government and how our judiciary system works because a lot of times we're focusing on the president and what he's done or we're focusing on our governor and what he's done but we fail to remember that there is a good light in our government that we tend to look over and that's um, our ability to have our peers and people like this um, give our verdict. Somebody needs to remake this again and make a virtual reality version where you get to be jury number 12 and you walk around, sit down. And at the very end, they look at you and you got to give the deciding vote. That's what I want. That's what I really want. I mean, this, this, this story has been redone in plays hundreds of times and, and it's been at the movie and everything. I think it would be a really cool experience just to put, you know, even if it's one of those Netflix interactive ones where you get to choose at the end, would you think, it goes, but I, I am curious. I like Ashlyn's answer. I am curious with you, Cody and Colton. Do you think that we are supposed to, you know, what, what the audience experiences in this movie, is it supposed to transcend beyond the film? I think that's the goal of any good film is to leave the viewer with a takeaway and leave um, and try in some small way maybe not to completely change the world or turn it on its head, but in some small way to alter, um, alter, or I don't know, to affect the viewers, if that makes sense. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but, and what I, what I really like about uh, pieces of art, as Mr. Malcolmson uh, put it, like this, is that, uh it's 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 pretty mythological actually you know but when archetypes are used correctly then you can then the story is truly mythological you can never truly tell what it's about uh but but if they're not used correctly and you can describe exactly what it's about like frozen then then <laughs> that is just pure ideology and it amounts to nothing. We're about to do an episode on Frozen and I'm going to argue your pants off, Cody. Is that going to be the next episode is Frozen? It, it uh, might be. <laughs> it'll, it'll be down the road. But uh, for, the, for those listening, um, we're, al we're always welcome to suggestions if, if, uh, if anyone has any good movies that they just like to hear discuss. And of course... We're welcome to uh, discussions with you, the viewers. Yeah. Uh, if you ever want to come on and have a discussion with us, then uh, we'll be glad to do that. Cody, I would love to see if whenever eventually I do Shawshank Redemption, I would love to have all three of you 
on that episode with Eric Harris and me. Um, having UHS students, I know how Cody feels about the movie, but it would be really interesting to hear Ashlyn's opinion about that movie because that's my favorite movie of all time over anything, any movie I've ever seen. That's number one. So good for hope, so good for justice, all these underlying themes with morality and epistemology. It's great. Uh, but that, that's the only thing I would recommend uh, for you. If you want a riskier movie, try American Beauty. I know Kevin Spacey is not seen in the most positive light uh, at the moment, but it is a, a very good artistic and serious movie, but uh, not for people under 18. I would, I would definitely put an a age restriction thing over that particular film. Um, I'm down for The Incredibles. Y'all laugh at me, but there's oh, a lot yeah. of deep stuff in it. Yeah. Oh. Utopia is another sure. one. Zootopia mm-hmm. has a lot of political science in it. That's what we want to cover a whole bunch of stuff. We talked about um, this is sort of going way off topic. We can sort of wrap it up with the last question after this. But we had talked about doing some serious, some more serious movies. Like we've already done The Godfather, and doing things like that, and then uh, sprinkling in some, you know, some less sort of deep movies. Like we're going to talk about Frozen at some point for sure. I think, and I don't know if it's going to be the next movie, but uh, pretty soon we're going to talk about Airplane, which is one of which is my favorite. Well, I love it. Yeah, great movie. Well, then you got to hit Blazing Saddles after that, or Monty Python, The Holy Grail. Those are going to have to be down the road somewhere. Oh yeah, I think maybe those will be more opinion than um, than philosophy, but we'll see what we yeah. can learn from them too. Um, but if you want to wrap it up with our final question, uh, all right, so our last question is one that we ask for all of our. Uh, discussions. What was your overall impression of the movie? Um, I guess I'll go first. My overall impression was first, like, yes, people have a realization about how much that their duty as a jury member has and how their impact. And um, they really shouldn't just, you know, oh, I got jury duty or how can I get out of this? It's really a service for whoever is on the stand Um, and my second reaction was is that people are people and that you never know what a jury is going to do even if it's a case that you think is definitely one-sided or the other and as I mentioned before that it can either help or that can really hinder a case. Mr. Malcolmson? I I personally really enjoy it because at school with my law club, it's a great movie to show, and I planned on showing that movie from now on. I think it's great for people of all ages. I think that you could show this movie to middle schoolers. Or I would probably go no really younger than that, but middle schoolers and up, maybe freshmen and up. Because I, I think there's just there's so many overarching social history themes in this story, not just the movie. If you want to do the book, it's fine too, that, that are so timeless. And I know in some ways it's kind of a sad thing to say, that these issues we still fight with even over 60 years since then and b- before that. But I think that's just what makes the movie so great. It, it's simple, but there's so much complexity b- behind this simple structure of a movie. You don't have to have transformers blowing up things in other cities and things constantly blowing up for billions of dollars to make a movie. You can have a super powerful story in such a very simple setting that can be timeless in its theme. So for me, Cody, it's, it's one of those movies that you can watch once a year and still get something new out of it that maybe you didn't notice before. And it's probably one of the few black and white movies that I can show kids other than To Kill a Mockingbird that kids today still really like. They, they really get in those movies. And the fact that it isn't black and white, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you see movies like, see movies like Schindler's List that's mostly in black and white that has another similar power effect to it. So I, I like it for many reasons that's beyond what I could even list or articulate. Excellent. Colton, what was your impression? I, uh, this was the second time I've seen this movie prepping for the show. And I have to say, I liked it the second time better than the first time. I know the first time I watched this movie, I didn't really know what it was about. I, I hadn't heard of it really before you brought it up. And, um, Actually, I was a little bit disappointed that it was going to be about the jury, which is strange coming from a law club background. But, you know, you you want to see all the action in the courtroom and, like, what that's all about. But I ended up loving it by the end, all the different debates and things, because it really, 
illustrates the importance of the jury, like Ashton talks about. And I, it's just, it's great because it shows all kinds of different backgrounds and how our experiences really influence who we are as people. And it's, and I'm, I'm a sucker for a black and white movie. I love the oldies, but um, I would say it's up there with, it's up there with my favorites. I, I agree with that. And um, this, this is a really great movie. Uh, surely if you're listening to this, you've already seen the movie. Uh, but if, but if somehow you're not, if, but if somehow you haven't seen the movie, then please, please go watch it. It's, I highly recommend this movie. Uh, it shows you a historical perspective of the judicial system. Uh, but at the same time, like Mr. Malkinson mentioned, it's timeless. Um, uh, and, and nothing you can do will change that. Uh, and, and I'll leave it at that. So, hey, can, uh, just, by the way, what, what medium did you all watch the movie on? Because I couldn't find it on any of the streaming services. So I just bought it on YouTube for about three ninety nine. Uh, what what did you all end up watching it on? Well, the, the first time we watched it, uh, well, both times we watched it, we watched it on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. Uh, the first time we watched it, it was included with a Prime membership. Nice. But the second time, the second time we watched it, it we had to rent it for three dollars and ninety nine cents. Yeah, that's good. So now your listeners know they can get it on Amazon Prime by renting it for that much. I think you can rent it for the same price on YouTube as well. So again, I'm with you, Cody. I, I would, I would, I highly recommend anybody to watch this movie. You would not regret spending an hour and a half or so watching this. And again, just like Colton, I'm a sucker for those older style black and white movies too. There's something nostalgic about it. All right. I think we're ready to move on to our uh, concluding segment. So, uh, what did you two uh, think about coming on this show and discussing 12 Angry Men with us? Uh, and did you, do you have any takeaways from this discussion that you didn't have before? Ashlyn, we'll start with you. Okay, well, I'm very excited. Um, I love podcasts, and so I was, you know, really excited to come and do one with you all. And um, you guys took this movie in a deeper perspective than I ever thought of it. Of course, I only look at law movies in one side and that's just strictly how the law is. And and it's really refreshing for me because I didn't know this movie existed, even though it was really high rated. And so I really enjoyed being exposed to that and um, your opinions. And it was a really good time. I had a really great time on the show. I know I talk a lot. You guys already know that. I apologize for that. But I will say that Cody, I love that you and Colton are grabbing the bull by the four horns metaphorically. And like Ashley admitted earlier, which I respect her for admitting that, that she never really heard about this movie beforehand. About three years ago, Ashley, I'd never heard of it. And, you know, I was 33 at the time. So for me, it's like I, I, I really want to praise Cody, you and your brother, for being a part of many people that's keeping things like this alive. If a movie like this is good and it really is as timeless as we think it is, I think we have an obligation in a way to really – to try to talk about these things, to try to show them on our podcast. And, and again, I'm just like Ashton. I'm a sucker for a podcast. I love them. And I have my own, I'm on two different ones. And, uh, and Cody, I've had the honor of having you on. I hope to have Colton and Ashton on mine at some point. Again, you're, you're keeping something that has a, a great deal of value to it. And you're, you're helping to keep it alive on the internet. And, I, and you can never be disappointed by that. And I'm just honored that you would invite me on here and then, invest your time in me and, and Ashlyn and all of us. So thank you. Thank you for coming on, Mr. Malkinson. And I'll put and I'll steer our viewers to your podcast, which is called Knowing You Know Nothing. Uh, it's a it's a really informative podcast, really enlightening. I've been on five times already. Uh, I'm about to go on a sixth time. I know that was a lot of where we got a, a lot of inspiration for our podcast. So we want to really thank you, thank you. Mr. Malkinson, for being well, a, hey, I got a funny a story for you. You know, Cody doesn't even know it, but he's in a competition. But he, he doesn't even know he's in this competition. But my girlfriend, which is Letha Page that's been on the podcast several times, she's actually in this weird competitive moment. So I hope she listens to this later with Cody. She hated that Cody had more podcast episodes with me than she did. Because right now it was, it was like a tie between Cody and, and Letha over – 
Oh. Mr. Malkinson, I'm afraid we lost your sound. He, he's still talking. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolmson, I think your audio cut out. He hasn't picked it up yet. <laughs> Put it in the chat. Um, I guess I'll, I would like to say that while he's still going, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say, um, since I've gone into political science, hey, it's hey. hard. Is it working? It's hard. Oh. Is it working? <laughs> All right, it's it's working now. Did you go out the whole time? Just the audio you. go out? <laughs> you did hear the fact that you're in a competition, right, Cody? Yeah, I heard yeah, that. Yeah, that's all you need to know. You can just delete the rest of that. <laughs> if you see me flailing my arms around and there's no audio, yeah, my, my mixer board froze, so I had to go off of that. It looked like you were telling a good story. <laughs> uh, I'm done. I'm good with that. <laughs> um, but I guess I would like my finishing note to be is that going into law or wanting to go into law, it's kind of hard sometimes, especially as much ridicule as our government is getting right now. But to me, a movie like this kind of reinstates why I want to, um, because I want to be able to put the, put the hands um, of our people to this and make them realize that our justice system is um, very good for what it does and that it's very fair. And um, that's why, you know, Lady Justice, she has the two things. It's very fair. And um, I just, it really encourages me. Well, thank you, Ashlyn. I'm so glad that you could come on with us and talk, talk about movies with us for a little while. And uh, same to you, Mr. Malcolmson. We really appreciate it. And uh, I guess this is, this is kind of our podcast. You want to say our, our final words? All right. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, be sure to join us next time. Uh, and as always, uh, make sure you learn from the movies. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Hey, that's a wrap. I like your uh, insert mine meme <laughs> over in the chat. <laughs> but I, I, I was trying to say earlier, Letha has been – in competition with you for like months now which we knew we never told you but you had the most shows with me and she's been trying to catch up so when we had a show together a couple of nights ago i was trying to say earlier flailing my arms around like a freaking whatever <laughs> and, but when she, when she did her episode on tuesday night she was all vic like victory baby she was like excited that she passed out i told her i said i love how you're in this competition and cody doesn't even he's not even aware that you're you think like this she loves you but she you know, she's she's really competitive that way. I told her though, I said, you know, when Cody does no country no country for old men with me, he's gonna be tied with you again. So she was all pissed off about that. <laughs> it's just funny that she she sees and counts how many times you've been on the show. So, uh, but yeah, seriously though, Cody, thanks to you and Colton for asking me to be on the show. And it didn't hurt that when you told me that Ashlyn was joining the show too. I thought that was cool. I, I told her whenever you lost your internet. I haven't really talked to her that much this year because she's she wasn't really at school that much. She mostly went to work. So it, it, it's been kind of a reunion show for me, too, to see Colton and you and Ashlyn again was really fun. Yeah. So thank you. Well, when we do these shows, we want to try and get people with uh, sort of relevant perspectives. So I thought Ashlyn – I know Ashlyn basically headed up Law Club for like yeah. a year. So, yeah. I, you know, who better? Yeah. She's good That's with right. Justin. Thank you. Ashlyn loves law stuff, so it's good. And um, definitely, when y'all get this like up and published, let me know how to listen to it because I love movies too. Like not just podcasts, I love movies, and um, I would definitely this is like that would be something that I would listen to. So um, y'all are on a good track there. Hey, just to ask one time, are all three of you fine with me putting this video, the recording on YouTube? You good with that? Okay, so that should be up. Yeah, I'll, I'll send sure. you all a message on social media tomorrow to let you know whenever it's up so you can watch it or share it. And then, um, Ashlyn, I use SoundCloud because it's free to put the podcast on, like the audio on. And then it's SoundCloud sends it out to Apple and okay. Google and all those other ones. So what, if you, have, you probably have some kind of a podcast app on your phone. It'll, whatever app you have, they, I think it's a purple mm -hmm. one. If you have an iPhone, it's the purple one that says podcast. You can find it on knowing. Yeah, I have that one. On there. So, And then, Cody, let me know whenever you guys publish. 
or if you need help doing that, I can help you do all that stuff. But I would love to listen to your first two episodes. It'd be great. We're getting, um, right now we're getting kind of a back catalog because we're thinking um, for like in the future, if we're sick one week or we just don't feel like doing it, that way we have Good stuff idea. to fall back on. But um, but I think we're going to publish very shortly. I think three is probably yeah. a good number. Now, whenever Cody goes back to college, are you two still going to do the podcast, but just do it remotely together? I think yeah. that's what we're going to do. Yeah, we had discussed uh, it. I'm telling you, it's cool because I know you two are closest brothers. Ever since my twin brother and I started doing a sports one, it, it's really helped us stay a lot closer because it feels like we get to hang out every week. And whenever we're two and a half hours away, it's it's cool to have the whole Zoom thing. So it helps. Yeah. But I'll let you guys go. Walter needs to pee. It's, it's great to uh, to see you all. You guys take care. All, all right. right. I'll see you. All right. Yeah.